and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to April 1986 for all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. I hook up the Turbo RAM print and put it through its paces. I review some older games. I take a look at a newer title. We give you some playing tips. We visit Type In Corner. And end with my demo with the month. But first, it's back to April 1986. In a shock announcement on Monday the 7th of April, Amstrad announced that it is to take over Sinclair's manufacturing, marketing and brand names worldwide, sending shockwaves through the industry. Announced jointly by Sir Clive Sinclair and Alan Sugar, the entire deal would cost Amstrad £5 million, plus a further £7 million for Sinclair's stock. Sir Clive acknowledged the deal should have happened sooner, with Alan claiming Amstrad are already planning the next set of modifications to the existing Sinclair range. He is hoping to add a built-in tape deck and joystick ports to the 128K machine before Christmas, but does not currently see any future for the QL. The Pandora, Sinclair's portable, may still yet be delivered, but Amstrad have yet to quantify its readiness and technical specifications. The deal was not the only one, as Sinclair's management also made an offer that would mean Sinclair keep it its brand name, but Sir Clive thought that that option was not viable. The game based on the famous cartoon character Popeye will finally be released. Originally produced by DKtronics, it was never properly given a full release as the company shifted its focus from software to hardware, leaving the title in limbo. Now the rights have been sold to Macmillan, who will finally release the game. There is growing concern from the game playing public and retailers about the long delays in software titles after they have been heavily advertised in the press. Amongst the companies at the centre of the problem is Ocean, whose games Knight Rider, Street Hawk, Batman, Super Bowl and V have all been given advertising space since December 1985 and were due for release around Easter time. Melbourne House have also been identified, with their games Asterix and Whitbread Yacht Challenge still not available despite heavy advertising. Ocean responded by claiming Super Bowl had already been released, but then conceded that Knight Rider and Street Hawk were still not finished. Batman is still in progress, and V should be available very shortly, they say. Melbourne House also had to concede that Asterix had been postponed until June, and Whitbread Yacht Racing had actually been cancelled. With all these changes, cancellations and delays, despite large advertising campaigns, distributors are increasingly being put under pressure, and they say the problem is growing rather than getting smaller. With the Spectrum 1 to 8 now widely available, more and more software titles are being identified as having problems. As noted last month, several titles would not load, and some had issues with Kempston joysticks. But now, more and more titles are emerging. The list continues to grow and includes games such as Alien 8, Nightshade and Nightlaw from Ultimate, Enigma Force from Beyond, Fairlight from The Edge, Hypersports from Imagine, Impossible Mission from US Gold, Swords and Sorcery from PSS. On and on it goes, which does cause some embarrassment for Sinclair, although many companies have said they are working on fixes. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Coming into the chart this month are Turbo Esprit, a great racing game from Jurel, Green Beret, a version of the arcade game from Imagine, Super Bowl, American football antics from Ocean, Bomb Jack. The official arcade clone from Elite. And Star Strike 2 from Real Time Software, the follow up to the impressive first game. And that was the news and top selling games from April 1986. For people who had the urge to use their spectrums for more than just games, probably the first thing that they looked at was word processing. There were many options open to the would-be businessman looking to do some typing, 
but all of them had one main problem. They were just software. That meant that once you had bought your word processor, you then had to figure out how to actually print your documents. A printer interface was the only option, unless of course you owned a plus two or plus three machine, but even then there were numerous setups, printer codes and parameters to consider. So what was the answer? The RAM Write and RAM Print interface from RAM Electronics. Released in 1986 at a price of $34.95, this all-in-one interface not only allowed you to connect direct to your printer using a standard Centronics cable, but also gave you a built-in word processor and a joystick interface. The unit itself was larger than a normal joystick interface and was about as deep as a standard rubber keyed spectrum. It also worked on the 48K, the 48K Plus and the 128K machines. Most modern printers have long since done away with the Centronics port, opting instead for USB or wireless. Tracking down an old model at a reasonable price proved tricky and it took me a few months to actually get my hands on a decent printer. But as a bonus, it didn't cost me anything. I rescued it from the skip. The only problem then was the ink was empty. So a quick search on eBay and a new cartridge arrived and was quickly installed. Plugging everything in and switching on didn't give any indication that things were working. At this point, you can use the interface with an existing word processor if you have one, but obviously you paid for the full feature set. As I couldn't find an emulator that includes the RAM write ROMs, I had to capture everything from a real spectrum. To activate the onboard software, you enter the command LPrint and the copyright sign followed by the word Word in quotes. This differs slightly for 128K machines, but the results are the same. You are presented with the word processor screen ready to start using. The bottom few lines of the screen are taken up by the options panel and pressing various key combinations allows you to switch on and off things like insert and overwrite and 32 or 64 characters. Pressing break places the cursor in the control panel ready to accept a whole set of single letter commands. Pressing D for example will allow you to view your document as it would be printed in either 32 or 64 characters. L will load a document, S will save a document, F will allow you to find a word or words in your text and there are others too, like cut, paste, replace, back to basic, and wiping the whole document and starting again. The top part of the screen is where you type. The display is only 32 characters though, which is a bit off-putting, because most of the time, if not all of the time, you'll be printing out in 64 characters. The software itself is responsive to use, and although it doesn't have a massive range of features, like for example Tasword or the Writer, it does give you enough to write letters and print them out, ideal for home users. The program does support printer control codes for things like underline or double width characters, and these are added by putting the spectrum into extended mode, entering a single letter, for example U for underline, followed by the plus sign, and then the text. This does not show up in the edit screen, but can be seen in the display mode. These codes though, however, did not work with my printer, but more about this later. Because the software is not loaded into the Spectrum's RAM, you have the full memory left, which allows up to 6,556 words, according to the documentation, but it doesn't say how long the words can be. For more control of the printer, you have a setup menu, accessed by typing LPrint Copyright Set, and here you can set things like line feeds or tokens. Another bonus is that the interface works with standard basic commands like Copy, LPrint and LList, the commands used for the ZX printer. So for example, you can print out basic listings and screen dumps. I tested this by doing a nice screen and executing the copy command. The results were, shall we say, disappointing. I suspect the problem is with modern printers. Older dot matrix ones may have worked well, but all these new modern fangled inkjet devices just can't cut it. There are more issues too. There are times when the software crashes and dumps you back into basic especially if you accidentally press the wrong key combinations. This has little effect on your text, however, as going back into the word processor will give you your valuable document back because it's stored in RAM. There's no mail merge, headers, footers, or screen formatting, but then again, it wasn't designed to be a professional tool. It was designed to be a quick and easy word processor with a Centronics interface built in, and it does this very well. I'm sure it would have been top of the list for anyone wanting just to print out their homework, or to write a letter to a family member. Overall then, it's a nice piece of kit, that does what it was intended to do with little fuss.
Brooke Rogers' Planet of Zoom was released into the arcades by Sega in 1982, but wasn't a massive success. It did feature an early 3D engine that later inspired Sega's Space Harrier, and strangely enough had little to do with Brooke Rogers' stories. In fact, he never makes an appearance in the game. The Spectrum version, released by US Gold in conjunction with Sega in 1985, attempted to recreate the arcade game. Not having any real 3D hardware or sprite scaling that made the arcade version look quite good, the Spectrum game had to revert to solid bands of flashing colour to give the effect of 3D. This effect had been used many times previously, and the PSS game Blade Alley immediately springs to mind. Both games look very similar. The idea is to survive five levels of four rounds. If you can manage that, you get to battle the mothership. Each level is slightly different, and is played in a different order to the arcade game. The first level sees you piloting your ship across the planet's surface, and flying through gates. The landscape moves quite well, or as well as can be expected, when using flashing colour bands. Once you have cleared enough gates in the time limit, it's on to the next level. And here you have the same sort of thing, but this time there are a few aliens to avoid. There are sort of bouncing things and saucers. You have to destroy a specific number of these within the time limit the game, or fly through the gates, and each time you do, one of the white saucers at the top of the screen is removed. Once all those have gone, it's on to the next level. The next level is pretty much the same, but this time just saucers. But here, some of them attack from the bottom of the screen, which can be quite tricky. manage to clear this, then it's off into deep space, as the landscape disappears beneath you. And finally, if you can stay awake that long, you get through to the mothership. A hugely unimpressive thing that meanders across the screen just waiting to be destroyed. Complete this, and it's back to the start again. Graphics-wise, the game isn't too bad, I suppose. The 3D effect is sort of okay, and the early stages are a bit dull, but there's plenty of action later on, and with the added time limit, you do get a feeling of urgency. Your fighter banks left to right nicely, but none of the other sprites are animated in any way. Sound is used well, with effects for firing, passing the gates, and explosions. The whole thing is quite playable, actually, but the major flaw is the lack of time replenishment. Not long onto the new level and your time runs out. You lose a life, and then carry on. A bit of an oversight, I think. Overall, then, not a bad game. Quite playable. But once you've completed the levels, there's not much to return for. Dungeons, released by Callisto in 1983, is a bit of a strange game, for many reasons. Firstly, it's listed as missing in action in the world of Spectrum Archives, meaning no known copies exist. That should make it quite rare. However, as you can see, a copy does exist, because I've got one. Anyway, back to the game. You portray a mercenary, out to clean up areas of evilness, and your goal is to earn 12,000 experience points, and find the Baron's magic weapons. These are a sword, a shield, and some armour. Hang on, no. Is a shield and armour technically a weapon? Anyway, let's carry on. You start off with an overview of controls. And once the game loads, you enter your name and start to play. The lower area of the screen holds your stats. Lives, armour class, etc, etc. And the top half shows your map. Here you can move about and try to find rooms that may hold gold, or weapons.
you can also see various monsters, and if you wait around long enough, one of them will start to chase you. If you get to a room, you can ask questions before you enter. You will be told if there are any traps in there, and what the room contains, and then it's up to you whether you want to enter or not. If you enter one of these rooms that has a monster, or bump into one in the maze, a fight takes place, and the view changes. Here you can see yourself and the monster, drawn in wireframe graphics. The fights are turn-based, and you can choose to hit the monster in the head, the body or the legs. If they block, there's no damage. If they hit, sometimes there's no damage. It's all a bit random. If they block incorrectly, however, you can inflict damage if you're lucky. Some of these fights can be over pretty quickly. Some of them, however, can take a long time. The fight will continue until one of you is dead. Hopefully, it's the monster. If you win, you get to keep whatever's in the room. Your stats are added to, and you are asked if you want to save the game or continue. The monsters all look the same, and the animation is pretty poor, but does its job, I suppose. The sound is just simple beeps, and yes, as you can probably tell by now, the game is written in basic. Despite its flaws, it's not too bad to play once you get the hang of it, but it's all just a bit uninspiring. While you're walking round the maze, monsters, traps and potions appear, and if you're not quick enough, you'll run headlong into them, so you have to have a keen eye. After the excitement of the first few fights, it all gets repetitive, and you end up just wanting to die so you can move on and play something else. Penetrator was released by Melbourne House in 1983, and is probably the best Spectrum version of the arcade classic Scramble. After a brief argument with the company Spectrum Games, after they also advertised a game of the same name and similar logo, this great game soon became the favourite with all shoot'em up fans. It follows the levels of the arcade game with a few minor differences, and after the initial sirens and fireworks, the game kicks off on the planet surface. There are radar stations to destroy and missiles to avoid. The game instructions say that leaving radar stations will increase the accuracy of the missiles, but this is a claim and difficult to prove. The graphics are wireframe as you can see, but move really smoothly and the pace is just about right to give the player a challenging game, but at the same time, not making things too easy. One of the major things missing from this game is a fuel limit. In the arcade game, you have to bomb fuel dumps to keep your fuel levels up. Penetrator, however, doesn't include these. When the next level arrives, we find ourselves in the cave system, and here the roof becomes yet another obstacle. There are no meteors like the arcade version, sadly, and this is a bit of a letdown. But this level is tricky to beat anyway. The sound is great, with nice engine sounds and suitable firing and explosions and bombs. The controls could have been improved, or at least tweaked, I think, but what you get is a good compromise considering the number of buttons required. The thrust key doubles up as a fire key, but this means each time you fire, your ship moves forward, something you have to keep in mind in tight situations. The traditional Q, A, O, P and space is used, with space being used to drop bombs. You can also use a Kempston joystick, 
but if you do, the same mechanism is in place, meaning to fire you have to continually jab the joystick to the right. On to the next level and we enter the city. And here there's less space to manoeuvre, and your piloting skills are tested to the max. Control is very crisp, and it needs to be in these later levels, and the playability is spot on. You always want to go back and improve your score. If you get past this level, it's back into the caves, but this time there are flying aliens out to destroy you. Each level has a different colour, with the final stage, the bomb run, being in red. Here you have to drop bombs into the enemy base to destroy it, which is very tricky and requires precision. If you do manage it, you are treated to a long firework display followed by a tune, and some extra points, and then it's back for another run through. The game has one final feature that really did set it apart from other games, a level designer. This is built into the game and allows you to easily create landscapes, place missiles and radar stations and test your creations. Not only that, but when you've finished, you can save out the landscapes and give them to your friends, as long as they've got the game, so they can load them in and try out your levels. The editor is really easy to use. You move the cursor around and you can plot the top or bottom levels and add or remove missiles and radar stations. You can keep doing this across all four levels, but what you can't edit is the last one. This additional feature gave the game extra shelf life, and I'm surprised Melbourne House didn't run some sort of competition for the best level designs. They could have released them on a separate tape, extending the game even further. So, to sum up then, this is a great game that gives you that arcade feeling on your spectrum. Top-notch gameplay and the level designer is the cream on the cake. Absolutely brilliant. This is Sunbucket, written by R-Tape and released in 2014. The game kicks off with a really great tune by Lee Spoons, before we get into some great arcade platform action. The idea is simple, turn all of the bulbs on across the platforms and avoid the evil enemies, and for extra lives, collect the letters M, O, R and E in the correct order. There are 40 levels in total, and the design eases you into the gameplay, as things get harder as the game progresses. The graphics are excellent as you can see, and the game uses the Nirvana multicolour engine to allow the spectrum to display more colours per character square, and this makes everything look superb. The well animated character moves around smoothly and control is very responsive. Sound too is used well, and there are some nice humorous elements to the game. Occasionally one of the light bulbs will switch off, so you have to backtrack before you can complete the level. Gameplay is fast and frantic, with the occasional pause as you wait for the enemies to get out of the way. But this does give you time to plan your route, and it never gets too frustrating. If you get to certain levels in the game, you are given a password, which means you are able to start at that level again, instead of having to play through them all. Although the challenge still remains of completing all levels in one sitting. As the game moves on, more obstacles are added. Things like crumbling platforms and disappearing floors, which causes you to rethink your route. All in all then, this is an excellent game. Easy to play, with great graphics and sound. What more do you need? Go out and give it a try. Hello and welcome to Playing Tips. Just before Christmas I watched The Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies and I thought in keeping with that I'd do some playing tips for The Hobbit this time. One of the most difficult things to do in The Hobbit is to find the ring. 
and probably the best place to explain finding the ring from is the goblin's dungeon because i'm pretty sure anyone who's ever played the hobbit has ended up in the goblin's dungeon so i'll start from there the first thing t that you need to do when you're in the goblin's dungeon is wait until thorin appears and then you ask him to do a few things first you need to ask thorin to open the window Then you need to ask Thorin to carry you. Now sometimes he obliges and sometimes he says no. But if you're persistent he will eventually carry you. Then you need to ask Thorin to take you west. And there you go, you're out of the Goblin's Dungeon. Now you need to go southwest, then down, then north, southeast, east, and you'll see the golden ring, and you can get the ring. And when you get the ring, you can wear the ring and you will be invisible. And Gollum will run off looking for where the thief is. So that's how to get the golden ring and get out of the goblin's dungeon in The Hobbit. I'm sure a lot of people already knew that and have done that in the past, but if you haven't, go and give it a go. Getting the ring is pretty much essential to completing the game. It's possible without getting the ring, but getting the ring makes it a lot easier. So. Hopefully, anyone who's played The Hobbit and had trouble finding the ring, you'll now be able to do it. Until next time, happy gaming! Welcome to Type In Corner, showing you games not seen in over 20 years. This month's game is Stomper that was first published in Popular Computing Weekly in August 1983 and was written by Barry Clayton. The listing was quite long, taking up one and a half pages and it included a machine code routine to manipulate the screen. This game is something different from the usual shoot 'em ups or Pac-Man clones that seem to litter the early magazines. The idea is you have to stomp out fuses on bombs before they blow up. To make this more difficult, there are skulls lying about and you can't use the path you've already used, so you have to plan. Each level has a different number of bombs to stamp out, depending on the difficulty you chose at the beginning, and as each level progresses, the fuse becomes faster, giving you less time. The graphics are typical for a typing game, and sound is just the standard beeper. The control keys are W, S, O and I, which move you up, down, left and right. If you get blocked in, you can move your current row horizontally by using the 1 key, or move your current column vertically by using the 0 key. This though, seemed to have some strange effect, and sometimes crash the game. Given the limitations of BASIC, this game isn't too bad actually, and it's a pleasant change from shooting aliens. This is probably the first time it's been seen since it was published, and will be available from my blog shortly. Welcome to the demo of the month. This month's demo is Higher State, released in 1998 by 3SC. The demo runs on a 48k machine, but does need an AY sound chip to get any music. You can run it on run to 8k machines, but you have to use 48k mode or the last section will crash. This demo has got a lot of great sections and effects, all packed into just 78k. Because the demo is quite long, I'll just show you some of the sections in short which should hopefully whet your appetite to download and watch the thing in full. The sections are joined together quite well, and one of the effects I particularly like is the swimming tadpoles, 
Or at least I hope they're tadpoles. Maybe it's sperm. And I never thought I'd be saying that on the show. We also get some nice shaded vector work. Now is that a computer or a toilet? After the smooth fractal patterns, we are moved into an acid house trip of flashing graphics and shapes and some pounding music before being dropped back into some great copper bar effects. Yes, that's right, copper bars on a spectrum that doesn't have a copper chip. We also get a nice scrolling landscape, which transitions into planets. The music goes through various phases and complements the graphics well. And it's nice just to sit back and enjoy. demos where some thought has gone into the whole presentation side of things, where one effect melts into the next, rather than just a random collection of coding prowess. A great demo then, and well worth tracking down. Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. Get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.